Hi guys, welcome to day four of our read aloud. Um, we're gonna keep going. If I didn't just lose my page, I did not just lose my page. Thank goodness. Uh, Harry, had we just dropped off that letter, so we're gonna um, read about what's in that letter. Let's see. Hmm, the plot thickens. It's said in a very untidy scrawl, Dear Harry, I know you get Friday afternoons off, so would you like to come and have a cup of tea with me around three? I want to hear all about your first week. Send us an answer back with Hedwig. Hagrid. Harry borrowed Ron's quill, scribbled, yes, please, see you later on the back of the note, and sent Hedwig off again. It was lucky that Harry had tea with Hagrid to look forward to, because the potions lesson turned out to be the worst thing that had happened to him so far. At the start of term banquet, Harry had gotten the idea that Professor Snape disliked him. By the end of the first potions lesson, he knew he'd been wrong. Snape didn't dislike Harry. He hated him. Potions lessons took place down in one of the dungeons. It was colder here than up in the main castle and would have been quite creepy enough without the pickled animals floating in glass jars all around the walls. Snape, like Flitwick, started the class by asking, by taking the roll call. And like Flitwick, he paused at Harry's name. Ah, uh, yes, he said. Harry Potter, our new celebrity. Draco Malfoy and his friends Crabbe and Goyle sniggered behind their hands. Snape finished calling the names and looked up at the class. His eyes were black like Hagrid's, but they had none of Hagrid's warmth. They were cold and empty and made you think of dark tunnels. You are here to learn the subtle science and exact art of potion making, he began. He spoke in barely more than a whisper, but they caught every word. Like Professor McGonagall, Snape had the gift of keeping a class silent without effort. Ah, uh, there is a little foolish wand waving here. Many of you will hardly believe this is magic. I don't expect you will really understand the beauty of the softly simmering cauldron with its shimmering fumes, the delicate power of liquids that creep through human veins, bewitching the mind, ensnaring the senses. I can teach you how to bottle fame, brew glory, even stop her death. If you aren't as big a bunch of dunderheads as they usually have to teach. More silence followed this little speech. Harry and Ron exchanged looks with raised eyebrows. Hermione Granger was on the edge of her seat and looked desperate to start proving that she wasn't a dunderhead. Potter, said Snape suddenly. What would I get if I added powdered root of asphodel to an infusion of wormwood? Powder root of what? To an infusion of what? Harry glanced at Ron, who looked as stumped as he was. Hermione's hand had shot into the air. I don't know, sir, said Harry. Snape's lips crawled into a sneer. Tut, tut. Fame clearly isn't everything. He ignored Hermione's hand. Let's try again. Potter, where would you look if I told you to find me a bezoar? A bezoar. Hermione stretched her hand as high into the air as it would go without leaving her seat, but Harry didn't have the faintest idea what a bezoar was. He tried not to look at Malfoy, Crabbe, and Goyle, who were shaking with laughter. I don't know, sir. Thought you wouldn't open a book before coming, eh, Potter? Harry forced himself to keep looking straight into those cold eyes. He had looked through his books at the Dursleys, but did Snape expect him to remember everything in 1,000 magical herbs and fungi? Snape was still ignoring Hermione's quivering hand. What is the difference, Potter, between monkshood and wolfsbane? At this, Hermione stood up, her hand stretching towards the dungeon ceiling. I don't know, said Harry quietly. I think Hermione does, though. Why don't you try her? A few people laughed. Harry caught Seamus's eye and Seamus winked. Snape, however, was not pleased. Sit down, he snapped at Hermione. For your information, Potter, Asphodel and Wormwood make a sleeping potion so powerful it is known as the drought of living death. A bezoar is a stone taken from the stomach of a goat and it will save you from most poisons. As for Monkshood and Wolfsbane, they are the same plant, which also goes by the name of Aconite. Well, why aren't you all copying that down? There was a sudden rummaging for quills and parchment. Over the noise, Snape said, And a point will be taken from Gryffindor House for your cheek, Potter. Things didn't improve for the Gryffindors as the potions lesson continued. 
Snape put them all into pairs and set them to mixing up a simple potion to cure boils. He swept around in his long black cloak, watching them weigh dried nettles and crush snake fangs, criticizing almost everyone except Malfoy, whom he seemed to like. He was just telling everyone to look at the perfect way Malfoy had stewed his horn slugs when clouds of acid green smoke and a loud hissing filled the dungeon. Neville had somehow managed to melt Seamus's cauldron into a twisted blob, and their potion was seeping across the stone floor, burning holes in people's shoes. Within seconds, the whole class was standing on their stools, while Neville, who had been drenched in the potion when the cauldron collapsed, moaned in pain as angry red boils sprang up all over his arms and legs. "'Idiot boy!' snarled Snape, clearing the spilled potion away with one wave of his wand. I suppose you added the porcupine quills before taking the cauldron off the fire? Neville whimpered as boils started to pop up all over his nose. Take him up to the hospital wing, Snape spat at Seamus. Then he rounded on Harry and Ron, who had been working next to Neville. You, Potter, why didn't you tell him not to add the quills? Thought he'd make you look good if he got it wrong, did ya? That's another point lost for Gryffindor. This was so unfair that Harry opened his mouth to argue, but Ron kicked him behind their cauldron. Don't push it, he muttered. I've heard Snape can turn very nasty. As they climbed the steps out of the dungeon an hour later, Harry's mind was racing and his spirits were low. He'd lost two points for Gryffindor in the very first week. Why did Snape hate him so much? Cheer up, said Ron. Snape's always taken points off Fred and George. Can I come and meet Hagrid with you? At five to three, they left the castle and made their way across the grounds. Hagrid lived in a small wooden house on the edge of the Forbidden Forest. A crossbow and a pair of galoshes were outside the front door. When Harry knocked, they heard a frantic scrabbling from inside and several booming barks. Then Hagrid, Hagrid's voice rang out, saying, Back, Fang, back! Hagrid's big hairy face appeared in the crack as he pulled the door open. Hang on, he said. Back, Fang! He let them in, struggling to keep a hold of the collar of an enormous black boar hound. There was only one room inside. Hams and pheasants were hanging from the ceiling. A copper kettle was boiling on the open fire, and in the corner stood a massive bed with a patchwork quilt over it. Make yourselves at home, said Hagrid, letting go of Fang, who bounded straight at Ron and started licking his ears. Like Hagrid, Fang was clearly not as fierce as he looked. This is Ron, Harry told Hagrid, who was pouring boiling water into a large teapot and putting rock cakes onto a plate. Another Weasley, eh, said Hagrid, glancing at Ron's freckles. I spent half my life chasing your twin brothers away from the forest. The rock cakes were shapeless lumps with raisins that almost broke their teeth, but Harry and Ron pretended to be enjoying them as they told Hagrid all about their first lessons. Fang rested his head on Harry's knee and drooled all over his ropes. Harry and Ron were delighted to hear Hagrid call Filch that old git. And as for that cat, Mrs. Norris, I'd like to introduce her to Fang sometime. Do you know, every time I go up to her to school, she follows me everywhere. Can't get rid of her. Filch puts her up to it. Harry told Hagrid about Snape's lesson. Hagrid, like Ron, told Harry not to worry about it, that Snape liked hardly any of the students. But he seemed to really hate me. Rubbish, said Hagrid. Why should he? Yet Harry couldn't help thinking that Hagrid didn't quite meet his eyes when he said that. How's your brother Charlie? Hagrid asked Ron. I liked him a lot. Great with animals. Harry wondered if Hagrid had changed the subject on purpose. While Ron told Hagrid all about Charlie's work with dragons, Harry picked up a piece of paper that was lying on the table under the tea cozy. It was a cutting from the Daily Prophet. Gringotts break-in latest. Investigations continue into the break-in at Gringotts on 31st July, the 31st of July. Widely believed to be the work of dark wizards or witches unknown. Gringotts goblins today insisted that nothing had been taken. The vault that was searched had, in fact, been emptied the same day. But we're not telling you what was in there, so keep your noses out of it if you know what's good for you, said a Gringotts spokes goblin this afternoon. Harry remembered Ron telling him on the train that someone had tried to rob Gringotts, but Ron hadn't mentioned the date. Hagrid, said Harry, that Gringotts break-in happened on my birthday. It might have been happening while we were there. There is no doubt about it. Hagrid definitely didn't meet Harry's eyes this time. He grunted and offered him another rock cake. 
Harry read the story again. The vault that was searched had, in fact, been emptied earlier the same day. <laughs> Please don't mind my dog. I apologize. Hagrid had emptied the vault. Hagrid had emptied vault 713. If you could call it emptying, taking out that grubby little package. Had that been what the thieves were looking for? As Harry and Ron walked back to the castle for dinner, their pockets weighed down with rock cakes. They'd been too polite to refuse. Harry thought that none of the lessons he had so far had given him as much to think about as tea with Hagrid. Had Hagrid collected that package just in time? Where was it now? And did Hagrid know something about Snape that he didn't want to tell Harry? Chapter 9. The Midnight Duel Harry had never believed he would meet a boy he hated more than Dudley, but that was before he met Draco Malfoy. Still, first-year Gryffindors only had potions with the Slytherins, so they didn't have to put up with Malfoy much, or at least they didn't until they spotted a notice pinned up in the Gryffindor common room that made them all groan. Flying lessons would be starting on Thursday, and Gryffindor and Slytherin would be learning together. Typical, said Harry darkly. Just what I always wanted, to make a fool of myself on a broomstick in front of Malfoy. He had been looking forward to learning to fly more than anything else. You don't know that you'll make a fool of yourself, said Ron reasonably. Anyway, I know Malfoy's always going on about how good he is at Quidditch, but I bet that's all talk. Malfoy certainly did talk about flying a lot. He complained loudly about first years never getting on the house Quidditch teams and told long, boastful stories that always seemed to end with him narrowly escaping muggles in helicopters. He wasn't the only one, though. The way Seamus Finnegan told it, he'd spent most of his childhood zooming around the countryside on his broomstick. Even Ron would tell anyone who'd listen about the time he'd almost hit a hang glider on Charlie's old broom. Everyone from wizarding families talked about Quidditch constantly. Ron had already had a big argument with Dean Thomas, who shared their dormitory, about soccer. Ron couldn't see what was exciting about a game with only one ball where no one was allowed to fly. Harry had caught Ron prodding Dean's poster of West Ham's soccer team, trying to make the players move. Neville had never been on a broomstick in his life because his grandmother had never let him near one. Privately, Harry felt she'd had good reason because Neville managed to have an extraordinary number of accidents, even with both feet on the ground. Hermione Granger was almost as nervous about flying as Neville was. This was something you couldn't learn by heart out of a book. Not that she hadn't tried. At breakfast on Thursday, she bored them all stupid with flying tips she'd gotten out of a library book called Quidditch Through the Ages. Neville, had, Neville was hanging on to her every word, desperate for anything that might help him hang on to his broomstick later. But everybody else was very pleased when Hermione's lecture was interrupted by the arrival of the mail. Harry hadn't had a single letter since Hagrid's note, something that Malfoy had been quick to notice, of course. Malfoy's eagle owl was always bringing him packages of sweets from home, which he opened gloatingly at the Slytherin table. A barn owl brought Neville a small package from his grandmother. He opened it excitedly and showed them a glass ball the size of a large marble, which seemed to be full of white smoke. It's a remembrance, he explained. Grand knows I forget things. This tells you if there's something you've forgotten to do. Look. You hold it tight like this, and if it turns red, oh, his face fell. Because the remember all had suddenly glowed scarlet. You've forgotten something. Neville was trying to remember what he'd forgotten when Draco Malfoy, who was passing the Gryffindor table, snatched the remember all out of his hand. Harry and Ron jumped to their feet. They were half hoping for a reason to fight Malfoy. But Professor McGonagall, who could spot trouble quicker than any teacher in the school, was there in a flash. What's going on? Malfoy's got my remember all, Professor. Scowling, Malfoy quickly dropped the remember all back on the table. Just looking, he said, and he sloped away with Crab and Goyle behind him. At 3.30 that afternoon, Harry, Ron, and the other Gryffindors hurried down the front steps onto the grounds for their first flying lesson. It was a clear, breezy day, and the grass rippled under their feet as they marched down the sloping lawns toward a smooth, flat lawn on the opposite side of the grounds to the Forbidden Forest, whose trees were swaying darkly in the distance. The Slytherins were already there, and so were twenty broomsticks lying in neat lines on the ground. Harry had heard Fred and George Weasley complain about the school brooms, saying that some of them started to vibrate if you flew too high or always flew slightly to the left. Their teacher, Madame Hooch, had arrived. She had short gray hair and yellow eyes like a hawk. 
Well, what are y'all waiting for? She barked. Everyone stand by a broomstick. Come on, hurry up. And that is where we stop.